Okay, let's me, it's again a pleasure to introduce you Randy Barnett. Uh, Randy is a law professor. Uh, he graduated from Harvard University and then went for a few years uh, acting as a prosecutor. You know these guys you see in the TV series. So he had the great experience there before going back to the university and uh, well, he went to the Chicago, to teach at Chicago, Kent, that was the Kent Law of School. Uh, and now he has been in Boston, at Boston University Law School for seven years. Uh, he publishes, and he has published a book, uh, well, which took uh, quite a few years before getting really published. Uh, you can find copies of it downstairs, The Structure of Liberty. And it's a magnificent book. I remember reading the. That was very likely one of the first uh, first version, the very very first version, where, which I read quite a few years ago. Uh, and he is, of course, a well-known lecturer at all the seminars of IHS or IES, as we as you may as you prefer, uh, for quite a, for quite a few years now. Well, he changed the title of his lecture, so he's going to talk about something completely different, but uh, never mind, uh, you will be able to listen to the original lecture later next week uh, during the summer university. C currently now, he's going to talk on the arms to civil society uh, of drug prohibition. Randy. Okay, well. Merci, Henri, for uh, that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here speaking to the hardcore, committed IES students who are not out having a good time this afternoon in sunny Aix-en-Provence. Uh, when it was raining, it was much better for the professors uh, to speak. Uh, we had much less competition, uh, but I appreciate those of you who have decided to forego the wonders of X for another hour or two to come and hear my talk. Um, I, before I um, begin my talk, I did want to, I did put a, uh, a uh, website uh, address on the board behind me, www.lysanderspooner.org. It is a website I've put together and I'm in the process of uh, adding material to uh, about a um, relatively obscure to everyone else, but prominent to libertarian, 19th century radical libertarian lawyer named Lysander Spooner, who wrote some wonderful, wonderful, radical, inspiring work, all told amounting to six volumes of work, and gradually, eventually, all his writings will be on this website. Um, I don't agree with everything Spooner said, but I am always inspired by reading him and therefore have, have tried to uh, honor him with this website. So please visit it when you get home. I would appreciate it. Also, as Henri mentioned, my book, The Structure of Liberty, is uh, for sale downstairs. Um, just so that you know, I'm very grateful for, to Pierre for arranging at the last minute that these books should be shipped here. IES had to pay the shipping, which were, was $100, and then we'll have to pay the shipping of returning anyone that's not sold. So uh, you may think about that if you decide uh, whether to buy now or buy later. If you buy now, at least you won't have to pay for the shipping. Is there a discount price? Uh, well, the, the, the price will include, you don't have to pay extra for the shipping the way you would if uh, you bought it on your own. Okay, so Ari mentioned to you that I used to be a criminal prosecutor and I have to tell you that it was one of the finest times of my life, uh, the most fun time of my life to be a prosecutor. I wanted to be a lawyer since I was uh, 10 years old and I wanted to be a prosecutor when I was in law school. I decided um, I wanted to be a criminal lawyer since I was 10 because I wanted to see that justice was done uh, before I knew what a professor was, what a professor could do. Um, and I was fortunate, I got to be a prosecutor. I got to be exactly the kind of prosecutor I wanted to be, which was a, what we call in the United States a state court prosecutor, actually employed by the county, 
uh, to enforce state law, not federal law. State law is against murder, rapes, armed robberies, the kind of crimes that we always used to think were the most important serious crimes before the war on drugs taught us otherwise. Um, and I was fortunate not only to be a prosecutor, but to be a prosecutor in the days immediately before the United States government declared a war on drugs. It's not that drugs were legal then, they were illegal of course, but the laws were not rigorously enforced and prosecutors spent very little of their time devoted to what we thought of as minor crimes, minor offenses. I spent none of, I was able because of my scruples to avoid any contact with drug prosecutions, but that was only because there was so little of it to avoid. Uh, it is sad for me to say that I could not be a prosecutor today in the United States or anywhere else because so much of what prosecutors do involves the persecution of drug users and sellers. And I use the word persecution advisedly. Um, and I'll say more about how that has, what effect that has had. What the government of the United States and other governments have done, but I believe the government of the United States is one of the principal offenders, is has declared war on an aspect of civil society. Um, war on drugs is a war on the people, the people who choose to into use intoxicants. And actually, of course, not only, not all intoxicants, but only the officially disapproved ones. Uh, alcohol is legal most places. That's an intoxicant I enjoy uh, myself, uh, sometimes more than others. Um, and, but that's legal. The others are not legal. So I, my talk today is going to be about the harmful effects of drug law, drug prohibition on, on uh, civil society. And I divide this topic into two parts. First, the harmful effects that prohibition has on drug users themselves. And the second part is the harmful effects that prohibition has on everyone else in civil society. Normally, let's talk first about drug users. Normally, we don't care about the effect of laws pro prohibiting conduct on the people that violate those laws. We don't care about the effect of the laws against murder. Uh, we don't care the effect that has on murderers. We don't care the effect of the rape laws on rapists or the laws against robbery on robbers. We don't care about that. But drug laws are different, at least they should be. Part of the reason for prohibiting drugs, the use of drugs, is to prevent people from harming themselves in some way. And that presupposes we're trying to help the people, that we care about these people, that we are going to try to stop from harming themselves. However, this means that if it turns out that the laws prohibiting intoxicating drugs actually works a very serious harm on the people you're trying to help, then we really have to care about this. We're, we must care about this. It's part of the assumption of the law. To illustrate one of the many kinds of harms that drug laws cause, let me tell you a story that happened while I was a prosecutor. One of my jobs as a prosecutor was to interrogate suspects in the police station who were under arrest, obtain confessions if possible, uh, interview witnesses, the police, to decide whether charges should be brought. One night, in the middle of the night, I was called to investigate, I was called in on a case where there were two suspects under arrest and I was supposed to interrogate them or discuss, uh, in yeah, interrogate them, yeah, let's call it that, um, in order to uh, obtain a confession if possible. Um, I think, I can't remember, but I think neither one of these two men had confessed it up to that point. Oftentimes I was brought in after they'd confessed to the police, then I took another confession since I was considered more independent than the police, more trustworthy. Um, as a prosecutor, but I, at any rate, uh, I interviewed these two men and from their own, well actually only one of them gave the whole story, the other one admitted part of it, and didn't give details. Uh, the, the, man, the name of the man I interviewed, the defendant I interviewed, um, his name Juan Caballero, 
Um, and he told me the following story. So the story I know is the story from his own mouth. Three young men who uh, he didn't know by name, but their names were Michael Salcedo, his brother Arthur Salcedo, and the friend of theirs, Frank Musa, lived close to Chicago, not in Chicago. They were about 18 or 19 years old, and they decided one night that they wanted to smoke marijuana. So, unable to go to the local drugstore to buy marijuana, where do you suppose they had to go to buy this perfectly benign substance, as benign as alcohol, more benign? Where did they have to go? Well, it's against the law to sell marijuana in the United States, and it is as it is in most of Europe. So where do they have to go? Who, who, is the, who are the people that violate the law? Criminals, right? You don't go to law-abiding citizens to buy stuff that's against the law. So if you're going to buy, if you're going to look to purchase a good from criminals, you have to go where the criminals are. That's how you have to do it. So where do they go? They went to a burger, a hamburger uh, stand known, known as King Castle on the northwest side of Chicago, which was uh, habituated by uh, gang members, Latino gang members, um, known as the Latin, uh, let's see, I'm trying to get, get my, there's two gangs in the story and I'm trying to remember which was which. Um, known as the Latin, they were, it was habituated by member, members of the game known as the Latin Eagles. So they went into the hamburger store and uh, asked the gang members who were hanging out there whether they had any marijuana to sell. Gang members said they didn't, and they didn't. They weren't selling marijuana that night. They didn't, that wasn't, maybe they never did, I don't know. But the, the uh, one of the, the uh, I think it was Frank Musa, thought that really, you know, maybe they didn't trust us. This is against the law. Maybe they think we're a policeman or something and they don't trust us. So in order to uh, make a good impression on these gang members, he started bragging about all the gang members he knew that he was friends with. And he named this person, he named that person, he named the other person. And uh, it turns out that um, he was naming all the members of the rival gang, the Latin Kings. On, you know, and uh, now all of a sudden, these gang members he's talking to, the Latin Eagles, are, are, are actually, you know what, I've got the story reversed, I just remembered now. It, he was talking to Latin Kings and he was bragging about um, his association with the Latin Eagles. So um, all the people he was talking about were um, Latin eagles, but he was actually talking to the Latin kings, and finally, so now these kings, they, they got interested in this guy. They said, really, tell us more, and he told more stories, and, he, and, he, and, this guy, and this Frank Musa started bragging about how he used to go out on what they called hits on Latin kings, meaning they would attack Latin kings, which uh, he never had, or he would know, I mean, he wouldn't have made this stupid mistake if he had ever really had this kind of contact. He was just bragging. So the, what do the Latin kings do? Um, they said, oh yes, well, we do know how you can get marijuana after all. Come with us. So they took these three guys in the backseat of a car and they drove them. It was in the middle of winter time. They drove them into an alley. They, they were, the, the kings were in two cars. They drove them into an alley. They, uh, they put a gun on them. At gunpoint, they let him out of the car and uh, made him lay face down in the snow. And then one by one, they took him back into the car, pushed the first one in the car, and stabbed him to death. Then took the, in the back seat. Then took the next one in the car, pushed him on top of his dying brother, and stabbed him to death. And then saved the braggart to last, Frank Musa, put him in the car and stabbed him to death. So all of these three guys were stabbed to death in the back seat of this car. Um, Anyway, that's, I mean, I know this story is true because the guy who did it told me it was true. I, and he told me why he did it. They just couldn't, you know, it was against their honor to hear all these things. And they just, and, and actually I, I asked him at the end of the confession because I was concerned. He was, he was pretty young himself. He was probably only 20 years old or 19 years old. And I was, a, as a prosecutor, anticipating what the possible defenses would be. So I would ask questions in the hopes that, it would, I, mean, I would imagine what a lawyer would argue later. He was just a kid, he got swept up into the moment, you know, give him at least a reduced sentence, etc. So I anticipate this, I'm a lawyer, I'm in the police station, that's my job. So I decided to ask him a question in anticipation of this. Sometimes I have to anticipate an insanity defense, not here. 
Other times I have to anticipate that someone can't speak English, not here. But that's what I was anticipating the defense that he was a young kid, got swept up in the heat of the moment. So here's what I asked him. I said, I said, Juan, if you had it to do all over again, would you do it again? He said, if it was a sure thing. I said, uh, there's no such thing as a sure thing. So he said, well, a lot of kings have killed people without getting caught, referring to Latin kings, not the royal kings we're studying at this conference. Um, I said, I know, but you got caught. Would you do it again? And he said, um, I'd have killed well, I'd have killed the uh, braggart for sure. I don't know about the other two. That made pretty compelling testimony at his trial. He was convicted of murder, sentenced to death penalty. I don't know if his death, I actually don't know if he ever was executed. It was a long time ago. He would have been by now. But uh, I have read various appeals on this case. But all right. The link between drug prohibition and these three deaths are obvious. If these three guys, they weren't the greatest guys in the world, but they didn't deserve what happened to them. If these three guys could buy marijuana in a local drugstore, they'd be alive. If they could buy drug marijuana the way they could buy cigarettes, they'd be alive. They didn't have to die that winter day. They didn't have to be died. They didn't have to be killed, slaughtered. What caused that to happen was drug prohibition. And this only illustrates one of the many harms to drug users that's created by drug prohibition. But what is this one? The first one, the first harm is that drug prohibition makes users buy from criminals. Not only does that put them in great jeopardy, as these three men found out, but they have to rely on criminals to supply clean, unadulterated drugs that they're going to put in their body. And I could tell you more stories about that about how, for example, drugs, many drug overdoses, by the way, are not caused by the intoxicating drugs. They're caused by allergic reactions to the stuff that the drugs are mixed with. Uh, that's something the police don't usually tell you. Something that's not, for example, mentioned in coroner's reports, autopsies. They just say drug overdose. Um, all right, here, let me just list some more effects on drug users, because I don't want to, I, I think I'm taking too much time. Um, drug laws raise the price of drugs. It's what they're supposed to do. It doesn't always work that way, but that's what it's supposed to do. But assuming it works the way it's supposed to, by raising the cost, the price, higher prices obviously require drug users to forgo other expenses, like what? Like food, like clothing, like shelter. That's not good for them. It's not good for their health. Remember, we're supposed to be concerned about their health. It may, the higher prices may cause people to uh, turn to crime in order to pay for their uh, consumption. It's not good for them either. And, very important, higher prices have caused users to employ much more dangerous methods of using drugs than they otherwise would employ under conditions of legality. For example, injecting heroin is not done in societies that never made it illegal. Injecting heroin with a needle is not, it's not the way societies originally used heroin. They usually used heroin by heating, a, heating it and inhaling it or smoking it. Now, it's equally addictive if you do that, but you're not likely to die of an overdose because you'll just pass out before that happens. Whereas if you inject something into your bloodstream, you can die of an overdose rather easily by not uh, putting in the right amount or you, you can have, inject air into your blood. There's lots of causing, you know, a stroke, there's lots of things that can happen. Um, so, but, that, but, the more, but injection is much more efficient, a much more efficient way to capitalize on a smaller amount of more expensive drugs than the other way is. So people, it forces people to use drugs more unsafely. It also accounts, for example, with needle sharing, which uh, contributed to diseases even before it contributed to AIDS. All right. Next, drug laws induce the invention and popularity of new and potentially more dangerous drugs than the ones that they substitute for. There was a great story in the Wall Street Journal back in the 80s describing how it was that cocaine became so popular in the 80s. And I'll try to make this story shorter, but it's an interesting one. What happened was people, uh, the US government started paying Mexican, uh, the Mexican government to, splay, to spray a leaf defoliant which makes the, kills the plants by causing the leaves to fall off, called Paraquat, on marijuana plants in Mexico. This was a government, a U.S. government paid for program. But what happened was when the, when the leaf, when the plane flew overhead and sprayed this defoliant on the plants, 
um, the farmers would rush out and harvest their crops because otherwise their plants would die and they would send them to market. Well, the problem was that Paraquat is a very toxic chemical. And now you're sending to market marijuana tainted by this chemical called Paraquat. Well, the consumers in California, primarily, who were using Mexican marijuana, they didn't want to use tainted marijuana. And these are these irrational druggies, right, who don't care at all about their health. But uh, when faced with actually dangerous drugs in the sense that it would harm their health, they, want, didn't want to, they didn't want to ingest it. So they started searching for another supply of marijuana that wasn't being tainted by Paraquat. They found it in Colombia. Colombia had a marijuana crop in those days. So they started shipping marijuana. Instead of shipping it up through Mexico, they started shipping it up through the Florida Keys, which is closer to Colombia, a whole different route of supply that the uh, drug authorities had yet to stop. When the drug authorities finally switched their interdiction policy to Florida, in South Florida instead of um, um, Mexico, then uh, the smugglers, marijuana is big and bulky. The smugglers started trying to smuggle through stuff that was more concentrated and compact. Well, you know what that crop is? The crop, the other crop that Colombia had, cocaine. And then at that time, the effects of cocaine were not that well known, and, and suppliers said, look, this is a non-addictive drug. It's actually more fun than marijuana. Try it. And, and a whole marijuana craze, I mean, a whole cocaine tr craze was found, was created as a result of this drugs, of this uh, chemical spraying in, in um, in, in Mexico, if the government had left it alone, this wouldn't have happened. It took a long time for that to end. PCP, another uh, formerly a, uh, animal tranquilizer, converted into a drug because it can uh, intoxicating drug because it could be easily made in uh, makeshift laboratories and in, in bathrooms in people's apartments. Couldn't be, didn't have to be imported. Another very da more dangerous drug. Um, probably not as dangerous as it was said to be. None of these drugs are ever as dangerous as they're originally said to be, I should tell you. But uh, obviously more dangerous. It was completely a creation of prohibition. Uh, the same thing was true, by the way, during alcohol prohibition. Before, in the United States, I can't speak for Europe, but before prohibition in the United States, the most common form of alcohol consumption was wine and beer. During prohibition, wine and beer being very bulky, hard to hide, hard to smuggle, um, Americans developed a taste for hard alcohol for the first time. Used to be only really wild people ate, drank that stuff to excess. Uh, and, and then with the, so scotch and rum and, you know, the things that made Joseph Kennedy, John Kennedy's father, rich, smuggling, scot smuggling Irish scotch through the Irish mafia, um, that's, um, that, that Americans developed a taste for that. Well, after the Americans developed a taste for this more dangerous, more concentrated form of alcohol, it took decades before its taste, maybe 50 years before its taste finally reverted to wine and beer again, which it kind of has. Cocktails, until recently, were pretty unfashionable, but, that's, or, but cocktails were very fashionable during a prohibition and then after prohibition. All right, drug laws also criminalize users. What time does this program go to? I think I'm going way over here. This is 4.50. 4.50. This is bad. Okay, 4.50. All right. So um, drug laws also criminalize, criminalize users. It makes every drug user a criminal. That can't be good for you, I'm telling you. It's not a good thing to be made a criminal. Once, identif once you're identified as a criminal, you oftentimes start to act like one. It changes your way of life. It cha changes your outlook, we should say. Um, it also, criminalization also gives the authorities the power to extract payments in the form of bribes and other extortion from people who are criminals. And criminalization makes it much more difficult for people to uh, seek treatment. Ask yourself if we were to make alcohol illegal again, whether people would be more or less likely to seek treatment for alcoholism. If doing so, the first step of alcohol treatment is to admit you're an alcoholic. What does that mean? Under, for other drugs, it means admitting you're a criminal. Is that, are you going to be more or less likely to go into a situation where you're going to admit you're a criminal? A lot less likely. And look what's happening to these politicians who have to admit what they did. So, what this means in sum, there used to be a saying in Vietnam, it turns out I think it was apocryphal, it never was said, but there was a saying that the left always said, that some soldiers said, that we had to burn down a village to save it. This was a quote always attributed to a U.S. soldier or a U.S. officer, which apparently did never, never was said, but it was always it was a famous, we had to build, burn down the village to save it. That was considered abs absurd, right? Well, here's what our policy about drugs is. We have to punish 
criminalize, poison, rob, and murder drug users to save them from the harmful effects of using intoxicating drugs. That makes no sense. All right, now let me talk about, um, well, let me once say one more thing about this. These, cat these consequences are unavoidable because they will happen every time you try to use co coercion to change people's consumption preferences uh, and create, therefore, a black market. And let me talk about, let me tell you the second story that illustrates the harmful effects of drug laws on everyone else. When I was a law student, um, I was assigned a clerk in a, prosecutor's, in a prosecutor's office in a particular courtroom. At that, in those days in Chicago, each courtroom, each judge had about 400 criminal cases pending at the same time. That's a lot. Three prosecutors, one judge. Uh, 400 cases. One of my first jobs was to take about 25% of our cases and ship them off to new courts that were opening up on the west side of Chicago. We had a 25% caseload reduction. Four years, uh, three years later, by the time I was a felony trial assistant in a courtroom of my own, our caseload was about 125 cases per courtroom because of the expansion of the criminal courts. That was a very manageable number. It eliminated a lot of plea bargaining. It allowed us to try any case we wanted to try. Um, it was very, very good. That was before the war on drugs heated up. The war on drugs heated up, and guess what? The caseload in each courtroom went back up to over 400 again. Well, what does this illustrate? It illustrates just one of the harmful effects on the public as a result of drug prohibition. Drug laws, enforcement of drug laws, drains scarce resources away from other types of law enforcement away from prosecuting the kind of crimes that when I was a kid we thought were the most serious, murder, rape, armed robbery, but which we know better now. Now here's some other consequences for everyone besides that one. Drug laws lead to increased crime in ways I've already explained. Raising prices creates increased incentives for people to commit crimes to um, pay for their uh, use. Criminalizing users makes them act out to be criminals in other areas. They get into a criminal subculture. Um, and more, most, perhaps most important, illegal, making drugs illegal creates a tremendous opportunity for murders and very serious assaults, but primarily murders. When I was a prosecutor, even before the drug war heated up, fully half the murders I prosecuted were, mur were drug-related, not in the sense that anyone was high on drugs, but in the sense that the person was killed because it was thought they were a drug seller who had either money or valuable substances that, they could, be, that could be taken from them. The murder of drug dealers by other criminals is a, it was half the caseload of murders I had. That's a drug law related, that's a drug law related murder, not a drug related murder, a drug law related murder. And it's only gotten more common. And I could describe the way, the grisly ways these guys were murdered. Like one guy with the scissors, one guy being hit in the head with an iron bar until he was dead, so they could take his money and his drugs. These were cases I actually prosecuted. Drug dealers are very vulnerable to this because they have to operate outside of law, law legal circles. So they have to isolate themselves and they're known to have valuable substances that could be taken and no one will complain. Drug laws, even more importantly, obviously create a powerful organized crime network. You know, the organized crime, the mafioso that we heard so much about that was largely, I mean, I realize that there's always been organized crime, but the big boom in organized crime originally in this century was prompted by alcohol prohibition. Um, and now a whole new wave of organized crime has been promoted by the other kinds of prohibition. Um, drug laws. In, and this is part that really bothers me in some respects the most, although I can't, it, the one that bothers me the most is the one I talk about last. But, uh, and that is drug laws cre encourage enormous corruption of law enforcement officials. The large sums of money available to pay off uh, police officers, particularly junior low paid police officers, um, is just enormous. Just enormous. And once you corrupt a judge, or, or, and judges too for that matter, but once you corrupt a judge or once you corrupt a cop, uh, on, on drug laws, they're in your pocket for anything. They don't just stop at that. Some may, actually some probably do stop at that, but it's not, you can't expect them all to stop at that. Um, and how does that happen? What's the, why is drug laws any different from anything else? Well, you have a black market with a tremendous amount of cash available. 
to pay these guys, and there's no victim. There's no, and I don't mean no victim in the sense that no one is ever hurt by drug use. I mean no victim in the literal sense that there's no one to pick up the phone and call the police and complain, and then up, could be upset if the police get bought off. If you're the victim of a rape, if you're the victim of a, a burglary, and the police get paid off by the other side, there's, that's risky for the police, because you can complain. But there's nobody can complain when you, when you show up at, and make a drug bust, and you find you know, stacks of money, not all of which makes it into inventory. Um, or drugs, not all of which makes it into inventory. Who's going to complain? The drug, the, the, uh, the, I mean, that's a common thing that drug users, say, that drug sellers say that the cops took the money. Um, so no complaining witness means it's just a tremendous opportunity for corruption and it just happens everywhere. I should also add, there's an additional consequence, which is the international consequences. And I'm not going to say too much about this, but I believe that the drug prohibition has really caused an enormous amount of corruption in Latin American countries. And drug prohibition in the United States has caused an enormous amount of corruption in Latin American countries. It has actually corrupted the whole government, caused the government to fall. Uh, because this illegal substance becomes the main uh, source of hard currency. And then the drug cartel runs the country, and nobody's going to stop that. Who's going to stop that? Um, so we, have, we, we export that problem. Drug laws lead to enormous invasions of privacy for everyone. Um, persons who engage in this kind of behavior are trying to hide their uh, behavior from public scrutiny. Therefore, if you're going to catch them, you've got to invade private spaces to catch them. There's no other way to do it. You invade it with informants. You invade it with searches. Searches without probable cause, but which you afterwards make up probable cause for. Um, you invade it with electronic surveillance. Um, these techniques have to be used. You cannot blame law enforcement for using the only techniques they can use to enforce laws that cannot be enforced any other way. And once the precedent for using the techniques in drug law in drug prohibition is established in the courts, the way the legal system works is it's therefore legal for every other thing. We have lost so many civil liberties in the United States, constitutional liberties in the United States because of drug, drug prohibition. I could not enumerate them all. And that may be another of the major categories of consequences. Police can't enforce these laws without violating the Constitution, and prosecutors, after the fact, have to argue why it should be constitutional for the police to do what they did, and one by one, occasionally a judge will say yes, and now there goes your constitutional rights. It's happened all over the place. Okay. Um, I guess the only other thing I would talk about is uh, the other side of the picture. Why do, why do we have drug laws if this is the price that we have to pay? And I, I'll tell you one little story. I gave this same speech once to an, a, a law enforcement association, Illinois uh, Regional Law Enforcement Association, made up of judges, police chiefs, and lawyers of various kinds. And I was, I have to admit, I was quite nervous about this because I'd given this speech many times and I was always the authority, as I am here, you know, I'm the former prosecutor, I'm the authority, you weren't, whatever, you know, so I can tell you this is how it is and who's going to contradict me. But now I have to go in to a room full of people, all of whom have much more experience than I had, and tell them the same story, the exact same speech, this is what happens, this is what it's like. You know, and any one of them could get up and tell you, you're full of it, it's not the way it is. So I was pretty nervous about this. I don't know what they're going to say. But I decided to take a chance. I gave the talk, the same talk I just gave to you. And then at the end of each factual claim, almost every factual claim, particularly, I, mean, I remember the one specifically when I was talking about the corruption of police. This was with police chiefs in the room. I would say, this is happening, and you know it. This is happening, and you know it. And I'd say that per periodically throughout the speech. And you know what? After the speech, not one person in that room contradicted my factual claims. Even I was a little surprised. I mean, some representatives of the Department of uh, uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration got up and yelled at me about, you know, the effects, the harmful effects of legalization, which is what I'm turning my attention to now. But nobody said I was wrong about the facts I was describing. Nobody. They were actually pretty sympathetic, I have to say. All right. Um, What's the whole point of this? Why, won't, why can't we end this policy? Uh, we can't end this policy because people believe more people will use drugs if you end this policy than currently do. That's basically what it boils down to. Everybody will use drugs, or more, many more people will use drugs, and you'll have a lot of bad con uh, uh, consequences. 
what do we say in response to this? There's a few things to say. Um, first of all, no one knows. I don't care what they say with great certainty, nobody knows whether drug, drug use will increase or decrease. Um, an inappropriate fear of the unknown should not stop us from ending these consequences that we can be guaranteed of ending if we end prohibition. Um, even a moderate increase in drug use would be worth it if we could get rid of all these consequences that I've identified. And you also have to keep in mind that the number of people who use intoxicating drugs is very, very, very small as a percentage of society. Uh, maybe a few million users in the United States of hard drugs. Uh, maybe a few million more of marijuana, but it's a very small number. It's the reason why there's no political constituency for abolishing the laws, because there's so few people using it. If it was something very popular like alcohol, there'd be much more of a political constituency for abolishing it. So you really are persecuting a very small number of people, and we're wreaking enormous damage on, society, on the civil society as a whole from this policy. I remember once there was a speech given by Bob, uh, by, uh, Bob Bennett, uh, one of the, at that time, the Reagan administration drugs are a person I can't abide, I can't stand to listen to. Um, in his speech in California, this was years ago, he said that uh, California was being too lenient on casual users of drugs, which he said in his own speech were 75 to 80 percent of all users. And how did he define casual users? He defined casual users as people who use drugs less than once a week. So that's who we have to be so excited about. People who use intoxicating drugs less than once a week. We're gonna tear apart the entire legal system to get at the 85% of people who use these drugs less than once a week. I ask you, is that worth it? Okay, um, I have more things I can say um, that I, I, I think I don't, I'll get to the question, I'll get to in the question period, uh, you know, children and whatever, issues of children. But I will say this, ending prohibition is no panacea for crime. Um, ending prohibition is no panacea for drug use, even though I think there are benefits to be had for that. It's merely the first step towards restoring civil society and allowing, in this area, and allowing civil society to work to moderate the use of drugs, the way it works to moderate the use of alcohol. Um, and even to eliminate the abuse of alcohol in the form of, you know, drunk driving, which is greatly reduced because of social pressure. Um, it used to be fashionable to drive drunk. I knew a lot of prosecutors that used to drive drunk. Um, we all went out drinking together. I never did it, of course, but uh, the others did. Uh, and, uh, uh, and civil society needs to be able to handle this job, and it cannot handle it as long as it's made illegal. So thank you very much. Yeah, let's take five minutes questions. You didn't say a word about uh, seizure laws. What kind of law? Seizure laws. Seizure. 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 Well, uh, it's a whole other area of uh, corru uh, corruption that is just unbelievable. Uh, in the United States, it's possible to, um, what it's with this, the practice is what's known as civil asset forfeiture civil asset forfeiture. What it means is it's a civil, not a criminal proceeding in which the authorities merely allege under a statute that personal property like automobiles or houses or boats or whatever have been used uh, in the course of a, a drug transaction or been used to facilitate drug marketing and then the property is forfeited. Civil asset forfeiture. It's forfeited without having any hearing or showing of proof that this actually is true. The burden is then on the citizen to prove that they had not engaged in illegal activity to get their property back. And that no one they knew, you know, it's not enough, this, it can be seized whether or not it was the property owner who did the act. If anybody else used the car or the boat, if you, if, for example, in South Florida, the law, law, law enforcement officials made a lot of money, and, and the, by the way, the profits for this go to the police, office, the police departments themselves. The sale of these goods goes right into their budget, and, they, and now a certain percentage of all police, um, uh, police departments' budget is made up of civ money from civil asset forfeiture sales. Um, in South Florida, they were kept seizing all these luxury yachts because they'd go on and they'd find a roach, a, some little piece of drugs that were still left on from, say, a party, or there might be have 100, 150 guests. They just seized the boat. Didn't have to prove the owner had anything to do with it, any knowledge of it. They just seized the boat. Now you, get it, you try to get it back. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I think just just one point you might add. So, so, so stop, stop. Who is speaking? Okay. Chris, sorry, Christy Davis. And that is, it, it, if the sales are illegal, then the consumers are going to do something that most consumers don't do, and that is they're going to go in for pyramid selling. In other words, in order to, to get the money to purchase the drugs, you yourself become a seller of the drugs. Absolutely. And Absolutely. you expand the market all the time. So the process is totally self-defeating. Yes. That's part of the part I skipped over in my talk in the interest of time. It's particularly true, it becomes particularly true with adolescents selling to other adolescents. Because that's who reaches down into the schoolyard to sell kids to your, uh, sell drugs to your kids, and that is other kids. Um, they make money that way. They can make more money that way than any other way, and that's who does the actual selling. The pyramid selling, absolutely true. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Chang from Taiwan. It seems in, you mentioned about um, if we legalize drug uh, and. Uh, we are not sure if the demand uh, will increase or not. Uh, um, it seems I, I, I got some impression is we, we can se separate the demand uh, from two sides. One is uh, the total number in the society who use drug. Maybe this part won't increase because it's, it's come from different source, preference and the, uh, yeah. But uh, for those persons, they have already used drug because the price is falling down. So according from economic theory, it seems the quantity they use, the drug, will increase. What's your, your comment about this? Um, well, it's an interesting comment. The first half is as interesting as the second half. One of the assumptions of the argument that there will be a great increase in the number of users is that there is this great body of people who are not now abusing drugs or using intoxicants who would use it if we change the laws. And I think there's no reason to be confident that that's true. Once you take into account that many intoxicants are legal, and if people want to get intoxicated, they can do so now. And if people want to abuse intoxicants, they can do so legally now. The, uh, there is no reason to believe that there are people who are not either now using intoxicants or abusing them um, who would do so under conditions of uh, free availability, I mean market availability. So I think it's, it's, there's every reason to believe that the, the demand for this is relatively stable. Maybe it could change at the margin. Now the other issue we raised is if the price goes down, won't people use more? Um, I'm sure that in some cases that will happen. I think overall it's equally likely to expect that the money that is saved from a lower price will be spent on other things, perhaps on food and nutrition and other kinds of things, uh, it's possible. And I don't think, by the way, there's any reason to believe that drug users will use more harmful drugs. I think there's every reason to believe they will pay for bet drugs that, that don't hurt them as much. You've got to remember, most people who use intoxicants, maybe some in this room, most people who use intoxicants do so to get high. They don't do so to kill themselves. Um, and they would prefer to get high the safest way possible. And that's exactly what the marijuana paraquat story illustrates, that these irrational, crazed druggies wouldn't buy tainted marijuana because they didn't want to harm their health. Um, that's pretty typical. So I think what you're likely to see is safer drugs, um, certainly safer because they can buy them in a regulated amount, I mean like safer aspirin. Can you imagine having to go buy uh, Tylenol or aspirin off a street vendor? You'd really, you'd really be confident about the quality of the aspirin you're getting, right? Well, that's what they have to do. So um, that's, that's my response. Okay. My name is uh, Boris Todorov from Bulgaria, Sofia. I have a small objection to your last words, and it is, what if, by abolishing uh, drug laws, using cocaine becomes fashionable? Because uh, fashion are things that are temporary, but still many people fall in love with something. And what about little, uh, not little, but uh, students or high school pupils who just decided to using cocaine is just a fashion. It's not a habit, but it's a fashion. It could go over in five years, but for these five years it could real, uh, do real damage. 
Uh, I say it because in Sofia, in Bulgaria now, uh, about 60% of the students in the high schools are believed to have taken uh, small drugs, I mean light drugs, and maybe about 10% cocaine. Uh, is it legal or illegal in Bulgaria? It's not legal. It's not legal. No, so, no one pursues so, uh, so how are you going to stop it? I mean, uh, you, you've already made it illegal and it's happening. So obviously making it illegal is not solving the problem. Uh, I, that's, that would have been my initial reaction. That is, these things do become fashionable and then they're fas they, they wear off, the fashion wears off. Uh, lots of times because uh, the initial information the drug users have is not reliable and experience, for, you know, remember something else. Drug users rightfully don't believe anything the authorities say about the harmfulness of these illegal drugs because the authorities say that every drug is harmful that they made illegal, including marijuana, which, has, which is one of the most studied drug, intoxicating drugs that there's ever been, and there's been, never been a death one single death ever attributable to the use of marijuana. Um, it's inc I mean, generations have now used it, including the President of the United States. And, uh, the, and, and if there were going to be any adverse long-term health consequences as a result of marijuana, we would, it would have come up by now. Um, we would have found out about it. But we haven't, uh, it hasn't happened. Nevertheless, marijuana in the United States is what they call a Schedule I controlled substance, which is the most seriously controlled substance there is. Um, why should a drug user believe what the government says or what the experts say about the harmfulness of other drugs when they're obviously lying about the harmfulness of marijuana and perhaps other intoxicants? Therefore, when a new drug comes on the market and it's condemned for being unsafe, the people, the consumers are rightly skeptical of that. It, by the way, I, usually these condemnations turn out to be wildly exaggerated and untrue. Uh, maybe not always. You can't, you know, the government can't be wrong all the time, I suppose, but uh, wildly exaggerated. So um, I do think it would be more credible if actually we told the truth about some drugs, intoxicating drugs, so that people would believe you when you said another drug was actually harmful. And that might mitigate these fads when they happen, which usually happen when a new drug comes on the market which is not really controlled, so it's cheaper, uh, where the other drugs have been controlled, and then it has a booming interest in that drug until the authorities shift their resources to that drug, and then we have a new drug to take its place. Okay, let's take two more questions. I'm sorry, we won't be able to take everybody. So there is one in the rear of the room, nearby the booth. Yes, yes. Okay. Is this working? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Marise. I'm from Montreal. And um, it was a great, great expose about drug legalization and everything. But my only problem with it is that um, if you legalize drug, is it just going to be another way of taxing people? Which means it's going to be like cigarettes and alcohol and everything. So, <laughs> this is... <laughs> so, I mean, I think it would be a great pleasure of smoking a joint and enjoying it with my friends, but if it's just another way of, of giving money to the government, well, then I have a little problem with it. Well, I, I, I'm afraid to say that it's likely to be true since when you're in other circles besides libertarian circles, somebody gets up, they always invariably say, and not only that, but look at all the money we could make by taxing it. <laughs> and I said, well, there was a reason why I didn't put that one on my list of advantages. But uh, you can expect that certainly will happen. On the second floor. Okay, on the second floor there was, you were asking, yeah. Uh, where is the microphone? Well, gone. No, well, there, there's, there was. You already spoke. No. No. No, you didn't. Okay. Go ahead then. No. He was first. He was first. Randy, uh, what is your comment on uh, the use of drugs in sport? Oh. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I have to admit, I don't really have a strong opinion. Uh, it, 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 because it seems to me that it's just part of, it's more part of the rules of the game. 
that's to be set by the rulemaking authorities as to what they think is fair competition or unfair competition in the sport. For example, you can only, in baseball, you can only use certain kinds of baseball bats uh, and you can't use, you can't put any substances on a baseball because it, it makes the baseball move in a different way that makes it harder to hit. That's called a spitball. People try to get stuff on baseballs. I don't really know that much about baseball. Don't like it very much either. So um, I'm not that kind of an American. But the, um, it seems to me there's, you know, golf, you can only design clubs. You know, the golf ball is tightly regulated as to how much energy it is. Although it's said that the reason why golf scores have gone up so much is because they've made golf balls more explosive so people get greater distances than they used to get. I don't know if it's true. But you s I just think this would be part of that, that uh, these if they're performance enhancing drugs um, that people think creates an unfair advantage to some that would then cause everyone else to use it, like steroids, uh, et cetera, then I think it's appropriate role for the civil society. This is a, where the civil society comes in to decide, make rules against it. Just as, I should say, it's an appropriate role of employers to decide whether their, their employees should be using intoxicants on the job or closely related to the job. That's, a, that's how the civil society ought to regulate the use of drugs. Airline pilots should, not, should have, you know, I don't mind them taking drug tests. Um, uh, you know, if that's, if there's a problem there. Um, employers should be doing this. Schools could be doing it, although I don't see the real point. But um, the civil society should handle it, and here as elsewhere. It's a good question. Okay, you move the microphone forward. <laughs> yeah, you have it? Okay. That does not work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jan Havel, University of Economics, Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, responsibility for one's action. And I think it involves uh, all sorts of drugs, including alcohol. Uh, well, take an, take an example that, for example, I take some drugs and then commit whatever crime or something, I kill someone. Then am I responsible for killing the person, even though I did not at that point have control of my body? Or am I responsible just for losing control of my body? Um, either way, you will be held responsible. Um, and of course, the same problem have exists with alcohol more commonly than anything else. Alcohol, by the way, is a drug that does, that can be associated with violence. Unlike marijuana, which is associated with eating large quantities of snack foods. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question on the second row. Well, uh, I was just meaning to ask, is it or is it not a constitutional right for a person to harm himself? I mean, in most countries it is. Uh, in continental Europe it is. Is it in the US? And what do you have to say about that? Um, I do think if you own your own body, that means you should be able to, dis that's a liberal principle, you should be able to dispose, use and dispose and enjoy of your body as you wish, including harmful behavior. Look, you can't do this, but you can jump out of an airplane with a parachute uh, for fun. You can jump off of a bridge with an uh, elastic cord tied to your ankles. Um, you can do all, you can, <laughs> believe it or not, you believe, people actually put long slats of wood. They go up to the top of mountains and they slide down these mountains where are covered with snow. They run into trees, they run into rocks, they create avalanches, they get caught up in. You're constantly having to rescue these people with helicopters and dogs. Um, it's, 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 it's insane. It's insanity. They let these people do this. I can't believe it. They should prohibit skiing. Um, uh, it's, well, I should just say this. I have never skied. Um, I have also never used a, uh, an illegal intoxicating drug. Um, I can find my, uh, which was hard to do when I was growing up, to not use it, I should say. Uh, I've never smoked marijuana, I've never used anything harder than marijuana. Unlike George W. Bush, I've never used cocaine. Um, uh, and unlike President Clinton, who, uh, Bill Clinton, who's widely known to have used co cocaine extensively. His brother was actually prosecuted for cocaine distribution. Um, so um, I've never done that, I've never skied, but I, and I'll, I'll close with this. Um, there was a 19th century American legal uh, scholar, one of the first constitutional law scholars um, in, whose name was uh, in New York. He was the chancellor of equity court in New York named James Kent, who's my, the law school I used to teach at Chicago Kent College of Law was named after him. And he was someone who, um, he never smoked, he never drank, uh, he never 
drank anything but water. He never played cards. He never gambled. He was a completely uh, virtuous person with respect to this. And at the time of uh, uh, the temperance movement in the 19th century was getting going, people were, these, these busybodies would get around, go around and ask people to sign these temperance, temperance pledges. And this is how Chancellor Kent, who was this guy who was obviously very disciplined, responded. First he said politely he would not sign the temperance pledge. But then the people were more adamant and insistent that he sign it. And finally he said, sirs, I have never drank any alcohol, and if by the grace of God I never will drink alcohol, but I have a constitutional privilege to drink alcohol if I want to, and that privilege I will never surrender. That's the attitude we should have, I think. Okay.